ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you and welcome to the last item on the agenda for today, the SC Paul Memorial Oration. To formally commence the proceedings, I would like to kindly request all of you to rise for the procession. Please note that due to the current ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we have reduced the number of council members participating in the oration. I would like to kindly invite the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Professor Indika Karuna Tilaka, and the orator, Dr. Muru Chandra Dasa, to take their seats at the head table. You all may take your seats now, thank you. Now I would like to call upon Professor Indika Karuna Tilaka, the President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, to introduce our orator this evening. Miru Chandra Dasa, MBBS Colombo, MD Colombo, MRC Psych UK is a consultant ch child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Colombo North Teaching Hospital in Ragama. He is a medical specialist in behavioral, emotional, and learning issues of children, adolescents, and youth. He is attached to the Department of Psychiatry, Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania as a senior lecturer. He also works as a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medicine nursing and health sciences at the Monash University in Australia in an honorary position. Muru Chandradas obtained his primary education from St. Bernard's School at Paul Gahavela and entered Royal College, Colombo, through grade five scholarship. As a student of Royal College, Dr. Chandradas won Dr. F. E. Virasuriya, Peter D. Abro gold medals and the best students award by the group of 45. He excelled in hockey and boxing at school. He was placed at All Island fourth place in GC advanced level examination and entered Faculty of Medicine of University of Colombo. He graduated with Dr. Alaric Jaisinger gold medal for best students in clinical pediatrics and with several distinctions. As a postgraduate trainee, he won the Bobby Somasundaram gold medal for excellence in MD part one, Andrew Sim gold medal for the Excellence in MD Part Two, and Peter and Mabel Corey Gray Gold Medal for the Basic Research in Psychiatry. Muru Chandras has obtained MD Psychiatry from the University of Colombo, MRC Psych from Royal College of Psychiatrists in the United Kingdom, and Advanced Child Psychotherapy Training of two years duration from the University of Melbourne. As a researcher, he has won several Senate and Vice Chancellor's Award for his research related to child mental health in Sri Lanka. Muri is interested in researching in adolescent character and personal development, and at present, he is reading, reading for a PhD in that domain. Muru Chandadas is married to Dr. Lalani Ratnayaka, a consultant psychiatrist, and they, have, they are blessed with a son and a daughter. It's my great pleasure and honor to present to you the C. Paul Orator for year 2020, Dr. Miguru Chandra Dasa. Professor Indika Karnathilaka, President SLMA, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President-elect SLMA, Dr. Sumitra Tisera, Secretary SLMA, Council and the Organizing Committee. Thank you so much for your hard work in these difficult times. I am privileged that I am present in this oration 
at a time when the president and the president elect are one of my beloved clinical teachers. First of all, Dr. Samuel Chalaya Paul obtained his primary medical degree from Presidency College, Madras. In 1901, he was the first Silanese fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. In 1912, he was the president, Ceylon branch of British Medical Association, now known as SLMA. As a role model, he was a skilled surgeon, a pioneer medical professional, and a proud Sri Lankan. He was a trendsetter and a true inspiration to many before us. Today, I am happy to say I become the first psychiatrist, definitely the first child psychiatrist to represent the oldest oration of the oldest medical professional organization in Asia and Australasia. I declare that I have no conflict of interest. During the oration, I would like to cover several objectives, starting with are the parents and the child health professionals and child educators aware of child mental health problems? Can they refer children who need help? When referred, are the services able to help these kids? Can we diagnose considering the cultural context and can we offer practical, pragmatic solutions? What can we do to make things better for the Sri Lankan children? In Sri Lanka, we always say, the best things in the world are for the kids. That is why in the morning, we see school transport, very spacious, never safest, and sometimes we feel, are we witnessing a vintage vehicle rally? When they come back from school, we have the greatest pastime in the world, tuition classes. We have a very nurturing environment to our teenagers. We send them to tuition to prepare them for the most intellectually stimulating standard exams in the world. You don't even have to study for them or cram for them. If they don't have exams, we allow them to watch most intellectually stimulating entertainment with no violence at all. That is why we say, Lower Hondamade Daruanta. That is about the public. What about you as a medical professional? Do you offer the best for your kids? Imagine yourself as a physician, a surgeon, and oncologist. You diagnose a mother with malignancy. Did you take time to use the spikes protocol to break the bad news and check on the mental well-being of her children? You as an emergency care physician, a medical officer, treat a child with exacerbation of asthma. Did you take time to look for any psychological precipitants? You are a surgeon, you do a life-saving surgery. In the post of Brown, did you look for post-traumatic stress symptoms? You are a pediatrician treating a child with chronic physical disorders, maybe thalassemia, maybe nephrotic syndrome. Did you look into his attention at school? You are a cardiologist or a physician. One of your patients die of myocardial infarction. Did you take time to look into the grief reaction of his children? As medical professionals, do we offer the best for our children? When it comes to child mental health, what is very important is the critical brain development period, which is known to influence well-being and learning skills of children. As famous Bronfman Hemmer said, the ecological systems of the family, school, and the greater society plays an essential role in the optimal development of our children. During the preschool years, kids need to obtain the school readiness. They will show socially, enjoy playing with other children and share their toys. Emotionally, preschool kids will be able to comfort others when they are hurt and receptive to praise. Cognitively, they will build towers, count to 10, and understand colors. They will speak in sentences, tell stories, and share a joke. According to UNICEF, 96% of Sri Lankan children has attended some form of early education program. However, the government does not control the recruitment of preschool teachers. In studies in Colombo, they have shown that quality of care in these early education programs is quite poor. During the early 
years of life, as you know, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, attention deficit hyperactivity, present in the early childhood. However, there is no organized, systematized way of providing mental health guidance to preschool teachers. In a study done in Ragama, it was found that school teachers believed kids with hyperactivity and inattention are actually doing it deliberately and maliciously. And rather than referring them to a doctor, they label them as just bad kids. What can we do if we detect a developmental delay? We can offer them behavioral, psychological, and educational measures to make the outcome measures better for these children. Even though one-to-one -one behavioral interventions are not possible in Sri Lanka now, Pereira et al. have done studies in Sri Lanka and found that group focus, home basis approaches are effective as well. Are there any practical things that we can offer for kids with developmental delays in the early years? In one of our studies, we studied primitive reflexes. Primitive reflexes are neonatal reflexes, which are automatic involuntary movements. They develop during the fetal life and are present at the term. They have a developmental role that help the neonate to bond with the parent. They should ideally integrate into postural reflexes and disappear to allow normal development. We found that several Sri Lankan children with behavioral and learning issues have retained primitive reflexes. We implemented low-cost, home-based activities that help them to integrate back and improve their behavior and learning problems. We can train even a nursing officer to implement these activities at home. When it comes to child mental health, Professor A.F. John, a pioneer in mental health literacy, defined mental health literacy as not only the possession of knowledge. It is far broader. It is the knowledge of prevention, recognizing, health-seeking options and offering first aid skills, and also self-help techniques for milder disorders. There have been several studies of adult mental health literacy in Sri Lanka, but we conducted probably the first study of child mental health literacy in Sri Lanka and probably in South Asia. We did a cross-sectional study using the randomized cluster sampling method where the participants were preschool teachers and mothers of preschool children. We used a self-administered semi-structured questionnaire to collect demographic data, and we designed culturally appropriate six clinical vignettes and questions to detect mental health literacy. These clinical vignettes were based on actual presentations and the internationally recommended diagnostic framework. We selected five child psychiatric disorders based on the prevalence, need for early detection, impact on functioning, and availability of treatment. To keep things neutral, we added a physical disorder. In a prior study in Ragama, in the same city, we noted that dengue fever causes significant delayed anxiety and depression apart from its physical morbidity. So we picked dengue fever as the sixth vignette. Our picked vignettes were based on autism, attention deficit hyperactivity, learning disability or intellectual disability, and oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder is a behavioral disorder where children show inappropriate aggression, vindictiveness, and rebelliousness. While separation anxiety disorder is an emotional disorder where children are inappropriately fearful when they are away from their attachment figures. In all of these six clinical vignettes, we assess the knowledge in three clinical domains. First, ability for them to understand this as a health problem. Second, to understand the need for medical opinion. And third, to refer to appropriate service to get further help. In our results, we randomly picked 30 clusters of preschools, amounting to 523 participants that were 191 teachers and 332 mothers. Among the teachers, only a few had obtained formal early education training. 
majority of them has just had a training course in their own preschools. Among the preschool teachers, 60% were below the age of 40, but 38% were between 40 to 60 years, showing that there is high retention in this occupation. That means if we can give them a structured training, it's going to be worthwhile. Considering the major sources of health information, mothers and teachers consider television as the biggest health information to them, followed by newspapers and internet. Unfortunately, leaflets at the MOH office and notice boards were not considered as significant. A significant proportion of mothers and preschool teachers considered social media as a very valuable health information. Coming into the proper results, when comparing the results, the teachers, 86% of them, identified the clinical vignette on dengue and decided that it's a health problem. The best response for mental health vignettes was for the vignette or autism just at 24%. The same picture was seen in mothers where the biggest response was for dengue and the biggest response for mental health vignettes was for autism at 23. In the second domain, can they identify the need for medical opinion? Dengue was recognized that needs to be seen by a doctor by 85% of teachers and 84% of preschool mothers. But the best response for mental health vignettes was for intellectual disability at 47% and 46% in the mothers. Surprisingly, the mothers of preschoolers fared better than preschool teachers when identifying the vignette on autism for need for medical opinion. When it comes to the third domain, 85% of teachers and 83% of mothers decided that the vignette on dengue should be referred to the health sector. The best response was for learning disability or intellectual disability at 40%. When comparing the results of teachers between the physical health vignette to the mental health vignette, it was so clear in all three domains they had a far better knowledge on physical health vignette compared to the mental health vignette. The similar picture was seen in mothers. When you compare the teachers and mothers, there was no statistically significant difference. But for some sections, mothers actually performed better than teachers in identifying these as health problems. When you compare our results with other studies in Asian countries, what was clearly shown that even if you provide a short-term structured training for the teachers, they are able to understand these problems as medical problems and refer them appropriately. Coming to conclusions of the first study, the knowledge among teachers and mothers on child mental health vignettes was significantly low compared to the selected physical vignette. Surprisingly, Similar level of ability in recognizing and deciding on medical opinion and referring to services was seen between the two groups, even though you expect the early educators to have a far better knowledge about developmental problems. Let's say we can improve the awareness using communication methods, but are the services ready to help these kids in the future? In a recent narrative review, we calculated the child psychiatrist to child population ratios in different regional countries. And understandably, even compared to countries like Thailand, our ratio of child psychiatrists to 100,000 child population was extremely low. What have been the barriers in developing child psychiatry in Sri Lanka? Mendes et al. reported between 1997 to 2000, 28% of medical specialists left Sri Lanka and migrated to affluent countries. The highest loss, 56% of qualified psychiatrists during that period left the country. De Silva and Karnatilaka et al. reported in 2006 to 2009, 13% of newly qualified psychiatrists left the country. It was lower than before, but still significant. Kuruparachi et al. reported that only 2% of undergraduates decide psychiatry as a postgraduate career pathway, 
far below the rates in the West. All these factors have contributed to the development of child psychiatry in Sri Lanka. Before five years, there were only child psychiatrists at the Lady Ridgeway Hospital. But thanks to our teachers, after the establishment of child psychiatry subspecialty, now there are board certified child psychiatrists in several cities. In the future, it will expand more. Also, I should mention, for decades, consultant general adult psychiatrists have conducted child mental health services with much difficulty all around the country. Even though there is limited number of specialists, the burden of child mental health is rising rapidly. From the time of the 1971 and 1988 youth uprising, three decades of war, 2004 tsunami, 2019 Easter Sunday attack, and now the COVID-19 has caused significant collective trauma to our society. If you do not process this trauma, it is going to create ethnic tension and conflicts in the future. 25% of Sri Lanka's population is below the age of 40. And Guinea et al. found that prevalence of behavioral and emotional disorders were up to 13.8%. And Pereira et al. reported that more than 1% of toddlers they studied had autism. And significant amount of studies have reported up to 25% of school children exposed to war-related trauma have post-traumatic stress system. That means there's a huge burden of child mental health issues in Sri Lanka. Apart from the child mental health disorders, what about the physical health burden? We conducted this study at the Ray Rigio Hospital where we compared kids with autism with controls with minor physical problems. We found that kids with autism have more febrile seizures, epilepsy, bronchial asthma, atopic dermatitis, and recurrent gastrointestinal symptoms compared to the control group. So there is more physical health burden in mental health disorders. What about the opposite? In Ragama, we conducted this study led by Professor Metananda of 288 transfusion dependent beta thalassemia patients. We found that in all domains of psychological assessment, emotional, conduct, and hyperactivity, there were abnormal scores in patients with beta thalassemia compared to controls. Also, the Hanayaka et al. reported that among kids with bronchial asthma, more than 18% had abnormal or borderline emotional or conduct symptoms. So in physical health disorders, there is increased mental health burden. We diagnose mental health and physical health burden. Now, can we treat them? So we conducted this pragmatic trial of persistent motoric disorder at the Lady Ridgeway Hospital with a one-year follow-up. It was the first study in Sri Lanka. We assess kids with tick disorder. As you know, there are several types of tick disorder, transient ticks, persistent ticks, and Tourette's. We assess them using a Yale Global Tick Severity Scale and other scales for comorbid symptoms. It was shown that 78% of children better after one year with low-dose respiridone, but kids with comorbid ADHD responded poorly. But Tick disorders can be treated effectively with psychotherapeutic interventions, for example, habit reversal. But due to the limited number of child psychiatrists, many kids with tick disorders, as you know, up to 15% of pediatric population may suffer from tick disorders. During our study, we found that up to 29% of children developed significant weight gain with low dose respiridone. So we suggested by an analysis to the government that aripiprazole, a different second-generation antipsychotic, should be available for our kids. Especially South Asian children are more prone to metabolic side defects. Not only metabolic side defects, we reported child on antipsychotics developing tardive dyskinesia at the age of eight. As you know, tardive dyskinesia is a thing of the elderly population, but antipsychotics in children could have serious consequences if not monitored properly. 
not only physical health burden, kids with neurodevelopmental disorders are having sexuality-related problem. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, we do not offer comprehensive sexuality education in schools. So teenagers with hyperactivity and inattention are vulnerable to sexual abuse as victims and offenders. And due to the low mental health literacy, many neurodevelopmental disorders like autism are not detected in the childhood. They can present as teenagers with paraphilias with abnormal sexual tendencies. More than any other medical specialty, psychiatry has a closer relationship to the culture and the social life. Recently, we reported about the cultural aspects of child mental health in the post-war era in Sri Lanka, as well as the mental health impact on the young mothers of Sri Lanka. Interestingly, 63% of university entrants now are females. These educated young mothers after the graduation face significant psychosocial stress in a patriarchal society. They are educated, they are intelligent, but the society will look into them, asking them to fulfill the traditional gender roles. So these emotional frustration is likely to affect their mental health as well as their kids' mental health. Rohana Chandra et al. reported that mothers with depression, the kids are likely to suffer from significant emotional and behavioral symptoms. Interestingly, when we diagnose children with child mental health problems, we have to always remember the culture. Recently, we reported several children come into our clinic with reincarnation type presentations or claims of past lives. A seven-year-old boy came to us and he said he was killed by terrorists in his previous life and attributed his birthmark to be an injury which caused the death in his previous life. Five-year-old girl came to us who was diagnosed of asthma, said that he died of breathing difficulties in the previous life as a grandmother. Eight-year-old, extremely disturbed, academically superior child was brought to us, asking the parents to make him go to the priesthood. His demands were based on that he was a monk in his previous life. After careful clinical examination and structured assessments, we diagnose autism spectrum disorder in these all three kids. But what is interesting is several studies have shown that kids with autism are less capable of lying and less capable of imagination. In the context of that, these claims of past lives become very significant. In the last part of my oration, I would like to talk about future directions of child mental health in Sri Lanka. Whatever the solution we bring to the management, it has to be culturally accepted. In a recent critical analysis, we understood that many Western psychotherapeutic interventions have a close relationship with our Eastern philosophies. For example, mindfulness has been adopted by the West and given back to us as mindfulness-based cognitive behavior therapy. Also, concepts like impermanence, Four Noble Truths in Buddhism has a close relationship with psychodynamic perspectives. So what are the practical ways we can improve a resource-limited setting? Australia has high standard health services, but due to its vast geographical size, some regions of Australia have finding difficult to find child mental health experts. In a setting, we analyze the methods they use to overcome these limitations. They hold regular monthly clinical meetings headed by the pediatrician and the child psychiatrist, participated by social workers, speech pathologists, and school representatives. They together as a team discuss complex cases and ma formulate management plans. So they discuss the progress in the subsequent meetings. So this practical multi-sectoral approach could be conducted using teleconferencing facilities. Can we implement this to Sri Lanka? The Easter Sunday attack last year, April, happened in several locations in the country. The St. Sebastian's Church's Katua Petia was the affected most, 
and it was just 25 kilometers from our clinic in Ragam. And we had to face hundreds of children traumatized and referred to us for help. With only one child psychiatrist, no medical officers, one nursing officer and a social worker, we had to deal with all these traumatized children. So we reported what we did for others to use as the early phase child and adolescent psychiatric response after mass trauma. It was not possible for the child psychiatry to see these, all these traumatized children. So we were helped by the general adult psychiatrist, pediatrician, schools and teachers, church and even community volunteers and media. We implemented and gave training to professionals at each level, village, church, schools and the clinics to implement simple psychotherapeutic interventions. We conducted certain strategies and activities to overcome this mass trauma. Referrals without any barriers directly came to me from even clergy and community volunteers. For kids who were mildly affected, we provided supportive psychotherapy and we built a cognitive behavior intervention booklet in Sinhalese so it was trained to health staff and teachers in the schools with the help of the regional director of health services. Only in severe cases, we had to treat with medications. Not only the children directly affected from the blast, millions of Sri Lankan kids were affected by watching media and listening to their parents. So we made electronic leaflets available on social media. Some were shared more than 1,000 times within 24 hours. And due to the request of the teachers, we made leaflets to overcome the radicalization of psychological aspects. And we made videos to be telecasted on national media and social media so a population can have a basic understanding of the mass trauma that is caused after such an incident. What could have been more practical in this situation would have been telechild psychiatry. As you know, telechild psychiatry is used successfully for child mental health purposes in the West. We have personal devices. If the Ministry of Health can give us teleconferencing platforms, this can be easily implemented. It is not easy to see all children through a screen, but it is very useful to liaise with adult psychiatrists, pediatricians, and consultant JMOs to see complex presentations. So we request the SLMA as the pioneer medical association with the help of Sri Lanka College of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists and Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians to go forward. We can implement this in liaison with the national e-health guidelines and standards of 2016 of Ministry of Health. Practically, is it possible to implement telechild psychiatry in Sri Lanka? During the COVID-19 outbreak, many children of healthcare staff were traumatized. They were fearful their mothers were going to work in these disastrous conditions. Many of them were referred to us. Unfortunately, many of these kids could not be brought to the services. Either they were confined to homes or they were in the quarantine. We effectively treated many of those kids using telechild psychiatry, and we can say it is practical in Sri Lanka. Coming to the conclusions and the recommendations of my oration, first, the awareness about child mental health presentations among educators and mothers is low. They do not know the correct sources of support to refer these children. There are limited number of experts in the country with inadequate facilities. We need to consider the culture when we are diagnosing children and it should be incorporated in our postgraduate training. To make things more effective and pragmatic, it should be always multi-sectoral. So I recommend for the future to use electronic and social media to improve awareness, train teachers and counselors and nursing officers to implement simple psychotherapeutic interventions, conduct further research on group therapy and home-based therapies, with the help of other organizations to implement intersectoral collaboration using telechild psychiatry and find a unique model for our own services. We will never be able to copy the Western model of child mental health services 
due to lack of experts. So we need to find our own Sri Lankan recipe. This would not have been possible without my senior co-authors. I would like to thank founder professor of psychiatry at Kalania, Professor Kurupuarachi, Professor Saumya Basu at Monash, president of the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists, Professor Shehan Williams, Professor Hemamali Pereira and Dr. Sudashi Seneviratna of University of Colombo and Dr. Lalin Fernando, and especially my postgraduate teacher, Dr. Swarna Vijaytunga, for their contribution. I would like to also thank my department colleagues at Department of Psychiatry at University of Kalania, Professors Kurupachi and Williams, Dr. Spiris and Aruni, Dr. Chamara, Dr. Roshan, and Dr. Anuradha for their immense support. My family has been enormous strength to me throughout this my career. I first thank my mother for unconditional positive regard to me as a child. I thank my brother for her flexible personality and support. I thank my batchmate, my co-registrar, my fellow consultant psychiatrist, and my life partner, Dr. Layani, for her immense sacrifices. Best way to learn child psychiatry is to do a longitudinal case study. You can observe a child day in, day out to observe their behavior and learn child psychiatry is the best possible way. My first such case study is almost eight years now, my son, and I've just embarked on another case study just one month back. I thank my daughter, Anya, and son, Sihela, for their immense happiness. Finally, I thank my colleagues, my co-authors, and my teachers my colleagues in the Sri Lanka College of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists for their immense support. I thank current president, Dr. Vajanda, Vatala, Vajanda Kotalavala, and founder president, Dr. Swarna Vijaytunga. As a medical specialty, we are not requesting for billion rupee worth surgical theaters. We are not requesting for million rupee worth MRI scans. We are not even requesting for thousand rupee worth hi-fi antibiotics. We are just requesting for a place to sit and a box of pencils to assess the child and to direct, change the direction of the country potentially in the future. So we demand from you the parity of esteem to value mental health equally with physical health. As you know, without mental health, there is no health. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, congratulate Dr. Muru Chandradasa for that very insightful oration with practical and simple interventions and recommendations for implementation. And we also congratulate for him for his next case study and uh, also may be converted into another oration. With that, we come to the conclusion of the academic component of the deliberation of the 133rd Anniversary International Virtual Medical Congress of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Even though we come to the conclusion of the deliberations, all the material, the lectures, presentations will be there in the cyberspace. They will be released and will be available so that the material will be used and will be reaching uh, the different stakeholders who will be making, hopefully, the decision makers. And on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association and the orator, we invite you for refreshments soon after this oration. And uh, after the oration at 7, SLMA, the doctor's concert will be starting. That will be at uh, the webcast from the PGIA auditorium. All of you can join it uh, live streaming from the SLMA social media. Thank you. And please remain standing till the, till the ceremonial procession leaves the hall.